Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that you call us to minister your word so that the world may hear, so that the world may know. We thank you, Lord, that you entrust us with your kingdom. We ask now, Lord, that eyes would always be open to see your hand at work about us, ears always be open to hear, and hearts be able to receive and embrace it. And Holy Spirit, come and fill the hearts of your faithful. We pray these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. morning. It is wonderful to see you in the house of the Lord today where we truly do worship our Lord and Savior, the risen King Jesus. And as always, He is glad that you are here. And we are glad that you are here because we get to worship the great living King Jesus. Have you ever asked yourself, and I want to pose this question to you because I think we all have at one time or another. There's this one question that we often think about as Christians or when we're serving God is, Lord, what do you have in store for me? Come on. How many of you ever thought that? Lord, what do you have in store for me? We ask that question, don't we? We want to know what it is. I mean, even in our own personal lives, I know I like to know what's going to happen. I like to think about what's going to happen. I like to forecast what's going to happen. And it doesn't always happen, does it? No, we project as to what could possibly be. And so we have the same questions that we ask God. Lord, what do you have in store? What do you have in store for me? Today, 12 years ago, was the very first day that I preached at St. Elizabeth's. 12 years ago today, I stood before you and you didn't boot me out. 12 years ago. But there was a process in which we had to go through. We'd gone to seminary. We were in the Diocese of West Texas. I was serving at a church in what we call curacy. It's kind of like your first place that you serve and you learn and you learn the craft and you have a priest who teaches you. It's kind of like OJT for priests, you know. You're an ordained priest and you're there and you're serving. But usually curacies only last two to three years. So it was coming up on my second year and the rector there said, well, I think it's time you probably start thinking about, you know, going to another church and finding another position. And so we were kind of under that pressure of, okay, Lord, what are you going to do, you know? What do you have in store for us? Well, the bishop of the Diocese of West Texas said, how about you apply to Messiah in Gonzales, Texas? So we put our resume out there and they sent us there and we went there. and It was an old Victorian house for the rectory that we would have stayed in. The carpet was about that thick, you know. But it was right next to the church and it was a little bit different and we just said, "Uh." and they didn't call us. They didn't invite us to come and be, you know, their priest and, and family. And then Bishop Lillybridge looked at us and said, Well, hey, how about going up to St. Paul's in Brady, Texas? Now, Brady, Texas is really five miles from the geographic heart of Texas. And you know how big Texas is. So we drove up there. It was on a Saturday, and it was just kind of cold. We went up there, and they, old Texas towns have these squares. And we went down there, and most of the stores were closed. Most of the stores were empty. And so we drove through the town a little bit, and we drove back. And Bishop Lillybridge said, well, what did you think about St. Paul's? He says, how would you like to serve there? And I said, well, I wouldn't. And he goes, why? He said, because I want my wife to come with me. And she said, no. <laughs> well, in the meantime, we put in for the diocese here, and we sent our information in to... Ken and Bennett, and he distributed it to St. Elizabeth's, and and sure enough, we get a phone call, and they did a phone interview. Chrissy was involved in it, so you can blame her, (laughs) but we get a phone call. Deacon Lori was involved in it, too, so you can blame her. 
I get a phone call and I'm standing on my back porch and we're just having this conversation and conversation and conversation because they bet you through the original phone call. They've got a lot of people to bet. Next thing you know, how would you like to come and have a visit? And so Tilly and I came to have a visit. And when we went, we left here. And when we left, we knew that we knew that we knew that we knew that God was going to call us here. We had it in our hearts that God was going to call us here. Just the same way when we interviewed right after seminary that God was going to call us to St. Helena in Bernie, Texas. So he's like, no, I don't want to. But she knew. We came out of... St. John's in Kissimmee. We wanted to get back to Florida, but there wasn't an opening here. So God put us in a great place. Paradise of the hill country. It's gorgeous. Except for when we're unpacking our stuff and a scorpion fell into her hair the first day. And she was ready to go home. But we knew that we knew. But we still had that question. And we always have that question. Lord, what do you have in store for us? What do you have in store for me? And it's a question that we need to hold on to. A question that we need to embrace. If our hearts are open to serve our risen Lord, we have that question all the time. What do you have in store because I want to serve you? Just as Paul wanted to serve the Lord and he offered himself to him. This is what we have to ask, Lord, what do you have in store? And the question is, how will you respond? Because I think if we look at our readings today, there are basically four types of responses that we have. And there's plenty of examples about it. Take a look at Abraham. Now, I'm not going to go through all the Genesis about Abraham, but when you look at Abraham, in Genesis 12, God says, Hey, dude. I don't know if he called him dude or not. But he says, Hey, pick up your family, take your nephew with us, and I want you to go to this land, because it's going to be your land. And it's going to be the land of your descendants. Abraham didn't have GPS. He didn't have a map. He had a direction to go. But he listened to God. He listened to what he called him to do and to go. That took a lot of faith. But I'm sure he says, well, God, what do you have in store for me? And God says, I have a lot in store for you. So he goes. And we know some of the things that Abraham did. And at this time in our reading, he's, he's experienced the covenant where God has said, I will make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky and as the sand. And, and he promised him. God had made a promise to him. And Abraham had that hope. Not a wishful thinking hope. A hope and confidence of what God would do and what God would say and that what God would fulfill because God is always faithful. That's the blessing. He trusted God. And he responded in that trust and in that faith. And so... As this entourage comes, and I can just picture Abraham sitting under that tree in Marnie. It's hot. It's desert. It's like, oh man, I'm just going to chill out here for a little bit. These three come up. And they tell him he's going to have a son. Now, Abraham gets a little bit, and as we know later on, Abraham gets a little bit ahead of God. And sometimes we all do that. But God made him a promise. And even though Abraham can't see it right away, he still has faith that God would fulfill, that he would have a descendant, because God had made that promise to him. And he was faithful to hold on to that. Hebrews 11, we call the faith chapter. You can go through and read all about the people of faith. But Abraham's faith was righteousness, and it because he trusted God. Granted, Abraham gets in his way a little bit. 
But God is always there and He always has that faith and He always recorrects His course to follow what God has. The question is, do we do the same thing? Are we willing to be like Abraham and just step out on faith and go and follow God like that? Even though we'll ask ourselves, what do you have in store? But have that faith to trust. Abraham tells Sarah to go and get the calves and do all this kind of stuff to prepare a meal for you know, his guests. And Sarah hears this word that she's going to have a child. <coughs> she's got this skeptical faith. Okay, God, you said it, but uh, really? Do you really understand what's going on here, God? I'm way past childbearing ages. I'm way past all that. And you're telling me we're going to have... And she snickers. She laughs. You see, she looked at the natural rather than God's supernatural power, the God who created the heavens and the earth. But I think sometimes we have that kind of skeptical faith in a way. We wonder, really God? It's kind of a wait and see type of faith. Wait and see kind of attitude. Well, God, you said you wanted me to do this, but I'm going to wait and see. How many of you all had that wait and see attitude sometimes? Come on. This means yes. This means no. This means, I'm not telling you, but... But the whole point is, is that we do. It's like, God, you really want us to do this. You really want us to do this. You question. And there's good in that. Because you should be going to somebody and asking them to pray with you so that there's a definite confirmation. But we have that skeptical faith at times. Not that we don't trust God, but we just want to have the assurance that it truly is. That's the key. Is that you're still willing to follow even when there is some... Maybe doubt if you want to call it, but there's still some wait and see. Okay, God, I really... And it will happen. If you're surrounded by faithful people who are praying with you to lead you along the way. And you have that covenant of prayer with them. That's the key. Abraham had that kind of faith. Sarah had that faith. Yes, she was skeptical a little bit, but she looked at her natural rather than the supernatural. And then God did a supernatural thing. Imagine where her faith grew in that. And then we have our gospel reading today about Mary and Martha. And I think Martha gets a bad rap. I really do. I think she gets a bad rap because she has this faith that she wants to serve and she wants to serve with excellence. She has this faith to serve the Lord Jesus. She wants everything to be right. But she let things get in the way. Yes, she was distracted. And Jesus is saying to her, Look, I love what you're doing. You're doing a great job. You really have that heart of hospitality. You really have that. But you also need to embrace the Word. You need to listen to the Word. You need to em- take that Word to heart. Because if we just go around and do things, do things, do things, then how do we know that it's really the Lord who's leading us? We get so wrapped up in servanthood that we forget about why we're serving. It becomes us rather than Him. But we still need to have that servant heart. We still need to have that servant heart so that we can reach out to our community. You may wonder why we have animals on the wall. We had 30 some odd kids here for VBS. We don't charge. We feed them. And they come in here and learn about Jesus. The focus was... Focus in, zoom in, focus on Jesus. That was the theme this time. And we used a memory verse from John 20, verse 31. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And that by believing you may have life in His name. And those kids went out knowing that verse. 
we could have got so lost in serving them that we forgot about the purpose of serving. And Jesus just reminds us it's not just about serving, it's the purpose that we serve. It's more than just obligatory coming to church on Sunday and sitting in the pew. It's reaching out to those in our community, those in our local community, those in our congregation, those outside of our community, to serve because God has called us to serve those outside. Martha gets the bad rap, but then she changes. She sees what's happening. And that's a response that some of us have. And then there's Mary. I think she's truly a disciple. She hungers for the word. She hungers to more know more about Jesus. What a great response. To hunger after our Lord. If we just come here and sit on Sunday, you get the nugget, you get a trailer of what is in our scriptures and what God has done. But she hungered for it. But I will guarantee you, we are all like that. When we were in seminary, Bishop Howell was coming up to give the sermon at the graduation for the class that was ahead of us, the class of 2004. And so we got this, I'm sorry, I got this crazy idea. And I called his secretary. And I said, we would love to have Bishop Howell come to our house and we'll gather all the seminarians from Central Florida that were there at the seminary and we'll have a barbecue. Well, initially his flight wasn't going to be there. Initially, Tilly said, what? (laughs) You're inviting the bishop? So we got... We sent out the word and everybody said, well, I'll bring this side, I'll bring this. I went and got the meats and I'm grilling and a piece fell on the ground. And Bishop Powell believes in the five second rule. (laughs) He reached down, picked it up, put it on the grill again. (laughs) But I was so worried about serving him. Here's my bishop and he's here. And I saw all my other seminarian friends and and they were there having some good conversations with him as he's around. And I'm thinking, oh, when will I have time? I'm sure Martha was feeling the same way. When am I going to have time to talk to Jesus? When am I going to be able to say it? But I've got to get this done. And that's the way we felt. But you know, God's plans are funny. God always fulfills the purpose of what he has in store. We may not see it initially, but he does. So there they are. We've done, we're just finished eating. Everybody's just kind of milling around. And the skies open up. A deluge of rain comes down. Everybody's scrambling to take all the sides and the drinks and everything, put them in the kitchen. And we didn't have a big house. And we get Bishop Powell to come in and sit down. And we all gathered around him and sat at his feet. Just as Mary sat at Jesus' feet. And we had this conversation with him. A great conversation. You see, we all go through every one of those responses. But the most important thing is for us to always keep our eyes on what God is doing in our lives. Keep our eyes focused on what Jesus did for us. Because without Jesus, without worshiping Him, we don't have the Holy Spirit. We have to have Him as our Lord and Savior. And then God reveals Himself to us. There are so many responses, but these are just four of them. The complete trust and faith is Abraham. Sometimes, well, if it's going to be God, then you've got to show me. The servant heart that gets wrapped up and gets detracted. And the disciple's heart of sitting at his feet and learning. We go through all of those responses, but what's most important is seeing and sitting and focusing on what Jesus has for us to accomplish all that he's called us to do. That's the important thing. 
12 years ago I stood up here you welcomed me and Tilly and I were glad to be here 12 years ago but as we got here we asked the same question okay God what do you have in store and through the 12 years that question still percolates okay God what do you have in store why because he's Lord why because he leads why because we serve him and why because he's faithful so as we celebrate 12 years and I stand before you today I still say okay God what do you have in store and it's a question you need to ask yourself even about your personal relationship okay God what do you have in store for me how can I serve you and how can I worship you and how can I lead others to you what do you have in store let that be your question and let God reveal it Amen to take communion to those who are not able to be here Kay is going to see Jane and Jane she will carry with her the message that she heard today she will carry the same Eucharist that we have taken the same Lord's Supper and share it with her and whoever may be at the house and she will share our love and prayers that are being offered and lifted to Jane while she is not able to be with us so let us pray Heavenly Father, you said where two or three are gathered together that you are in the midst of them. So I ask that you would be with Jane, with Kay, and whoever else may be there. May they know your grace, your love, and your mercy. And may Jane know that we miss her, that we're praying for her, and we're lifting her up before our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Question that we always ask God. What do you have in store for me? What do you have in store? What do you have in store for us? But if we go to God with that truly heart that we really want to know, that we're going to submit, that we're going to, we want to servant heart, we really want to know His heart, then He reveals to us what He has in store. He will give us that direction. He'll lead us in that way. We may not know all the particulars, but just as Abraham didn't know all the particulars when he went into the desert, just as Sarah didn't know all the particulars how she would birth Isaac, just as Mary sat at his feet and she didn't fully understand everything, and just as Martha served, they never fully understood everything, but they were willing to follow. They were willing to open their hearts to receive. They were willing to say, what do you have in store? And I will follow. Will that be your heart today? Lord, what do you have in store for me? What do you have in store for us? I say that today too. What do you have in store for St. Elizabeth? What more do you want us to do for your glory? What more can we do for your glory? Not for us, but for you, Lord. That others may know your grace, your love, and your mercy. It's an honest question when it comes from the heart. What do you have in store, Lord? What do you have in store? Because when we do, and we ask that from our heart, we can go forth into the world in peace. We can be of good courage. We will render no one evil for evil. We'll support those who are faint-hearted. We'll help those who are weak. We'll help the afflicted. And we'll love and serve our Lord. And we'll honor all persons. Because we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us. 
And so now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Yep. Thank you. Well, at least it was only that. (laughs) Our going forth hymn today is All Creatures of Our God and King. Let's stand and sing. All Creatures of Our God and King. Oh, yeah.